Big Seance Podcast, Episode 28. Welcome to the Big Seance Podcast. I'm Patrick Keller of BigSeance.com, and this is a place for an open discussion on all things paranormal, but specifically topics like ghosts and hauntings, paranormal research, spirit communication, psychics and mediums, and life after death. So basically, anything that pops up in my paranormal world. The candles are already lit, so you might as well come on in and join the seance. Welcome back to a bonus episode of the Big Seance Podcast. It's episode 28. I've been on an every other week pattern now for a while, and this has helped me to catch up and even get ahead of the game a bit. So since I had some downtime, I thought I'd throw an extra episode in here just for you. Today I want to talk about how to record EVP. How you could start the practice of recording for EVP on your own, as a hobby, or for serious research. I won't go into detail about how to analyze your recordings for EVP, but this episode will focus on the EVP session itself. And maybe we'll save the analysis for another episode. As we are still very much in what I've always called the paranormal craze of the 2000s, the concept of EVP, or capturing spirit voices, is one of the more popular aspects of the paranormal, and a paranormal topic of discussion among investigators. As you probably know, EVP stands for Electronic Voice Phenomenon, and that's if you're talking about one, or phenomena, which is the plural version. So you can still say EVP if you're talking about several of them, rather than EVPs. What I'm about to say is something very similar to comments I've made regarding the use of the Ouija board. My blog and podcast tends to focus on spirit communication, or afterlife communication, if that's a term you prefer. I'm not going to be the fearful person that tells you not to use tools, such as a digital recorder, the Ouija board, or a spirit box, out of fear that something bad will happen. And a big pet peeve of mine is when these folks use the word play as part of their warning. And by using the term play, maybe they're just really only suggesting the same caution that I will put out there. But if they're suggesting that my use of spirit communication tools is playing, then that is such an insult to me. I guarantee that when I use tools for my research or out of curiosity even, I'm doing anything but playing. Sometimes the messages of these party poopers tend to sound like, it's okay for me to have fun with this stuff, but you're not capable of it. Your brain isn't big enough and you don't have the ability, so you're just not invited to the party. Well, it clearly didn't work on me. My work is very serious and focused, and of course, respectful. So while I would not advocate breaking any spirit communication tools out at parties, or using them with alcohol, or encouraging kids to use tools on their own, or working with people you can't trust, Using tools or recording for EVP to capture possible spirit communication can be a very cool experience. Don't get the wrong idea, though. It's hard work. Don't take the first sound you hear and run with it saying you've got an EVP when you don't. Each artifact needs to be looked at or studied closely, and you are most likely not going to have a full-blown dialogue with past loved ones. In fact, I very rarely confidently claim to have authentic examples of spirit communication at all. But the artifacts I have are fascinating, and the process can be fun. There are many, many ways of recording for and capturing EVP. For decades, people all over the world have successfully recorded spirit voices in their own individual way. There are basic techniques and there are techniques that are rather complicated, some requiring more equipment and more explanation. There are also techniques that, due to times changing and new technology, are just outdated. 
My experiences with EVP began as a paranormal investigator, but more recently it comes from research and conducting various experiments and seances, mostly in my home. I want to make it clear that my intention for this episode is to share how I typically go about recording for EVP during experiments in my home specifically. The process might be a bit different during a paranormal investigation, especially if you are investigating with a group. And before I really get into my process, I have to give some credit to the following researchers or authors who have influenced me in recent years. The late Sarah Estep, one of America's great EVP pioneers, Tom and Lisa Butler, directors of Association Transcommunication, and Randall Keller, a wise and experienced researcher who has been a great mentor. And he's also a former guest of the podcast from episode number eight from August 14th, 2014. A lot of what I know and the how-to came directly from these folks in one way or another. So here's my technique for recording EVP. First, you have to determine your location. Find a location that is both quiet and comfortable. In my opinion, good vibes help, so don't pick a place that tends to produce bad energy. Pick a feel-good place. You want a location where you are familiar with your surroundings. Do certain noises or creaks happen at certain times? The central air kicking in, the fridge, the ice maker, be familiar with it all. For example, at my home, there is a bathroom near my typical recording location. I've learned that after anyone takes a shower or uses a lot of hot water, the water lines will pop and make a few loud thud sounds on the wall for a few minutes. I know that in a recording, my DVR next to the TV sounds more like a train for some reason, so most of the time I unplug it during a session. But you don't have to. We'll talk about why you might want some background noise a little bit later. Some things to consider regarding your recording environment. Ideally, you will want to record when you are alone in the house or location. If someone is in the home with you and cooperating with your session, be sure to document their location and the fact that they are there, just in case confusion pops up later and you don't remember. With certain sensitive recorders, someone speaking softly or making noise several rooms away or even on a different floor, will seem incredibly close, even if you don't hear it with your own ears. You'll want to pick a time of day where the neighborhood, if that is an issue for you, is at its quietest. This is perhaps why many people choose to record later in the evenings. Either in your recording or in a log of your session, document specific equipment you're using, if it's out of the ordinary. Document anything you may be trying or changing as far as techniques go. Also, document anything odd in your surroundings for a session. Is the ceiling fan on? Is your husband downstairs reading the paper? Are there roofers across the street? Is there thunder and lightning outside? Also, and this is important and comes from personal experience, is the dog in the room? Sometimes my dog is with me and other times not. When listening back later, it may be important to know. The next thing, and possibly most important to think about, are the recorders and their placement. Nowadays, I think it is safe to say that most researchers and investigators use digital recorders. But if you go digital, definitely look for USB capabilities. In this day and age, Capturing an EVP is not going to be very impressive if it's stuck on a recorder forever, with no way to share or store it digitally. There are several brands and models that are very easy to use and upload to your computer for listening and analysis. I use the Sony ICD PX820 and Sony ICD PX720, and they're nearly identical. They're also old models, so don't go looking for them on Amazon unless you're wanting a used one. I also use a nicer and techier Tascam DR07, 
with an external Tascam microphone most of the time. Something I'm going to have to soon consider for my own sessions is that now that I have updated to a new computer, the recordings from my older Sony recorders have had to be uploaded to my old PC and then somehow exported to the new computer. It's probably about time to update my recorders. In my opinion, it is important to use two recorders at the same time for sessions. These recorders should be different models or brands. Let me explain why I do this. One of my recorders, the Tascam, is a little fancier and a little more expensive than the others. As I mentioned earlier, I also tend to use an external microphone with the Tascam. The other recorders are more basic and simple, and most of the time I just use the internal microphone with those. I almost never capture EVP with a better recorder, and that's okay. Because of how well it records and how sensitive it is, muffled or unclear sounds from the environment picked up in another recorder will most likely be more obvious when I listen to the recording from the better recorder. Many times, I'll hear something that sounds like it is crawling up from the depths of hell. I'll replay it 30 times, trying to figure out if it is saying, let's get Keller, or we're hiding in the cellar, etc. But then when I listen to the other recorder, it is clear that it was just my wheezing intake of breath or my stomach processing my last meal. Because of its history of not recording EVP, and because analysis of EVP recordings consumes so much time, I've gotten to the point I don't always go through the entire recording from the better recorder, unless I have to. Sometimes, I'll just compare the flagged moments from the other recorder. I think this is just a matter of getting used to the recorders you use. As kind of a side note, I should tell you that in my most recent EVP sessions, I've begun experimenting with using the very mic that is picking up my voice now. This is a high-powered condenser microphone, which is plugged into a mixer, and is used by many podcasters, musicians, and other professionals. With this mic, I can record directly to my audio software on the computer. I'm not used to listening for EVP in a recording with such great audio quality, so it is kind of a different experience. I'm not aware yet if there are others who use this type of microphone in EVP research. I don't have anything to report to you yet, but maybe I'll have some great recording studio quality EVP to share with you in the future. Many paranormal investigators or EVP researchers will tell you that EVP are not often recorded in multiple recorders at one time. This isn't always the case, but it seems to be the case with my research anyway. If I've recorded a mysterious sound that I can't identify, or if I am having trouble deciding if something is paranormal in nature, I listen for the same moment in both recordings. If I hear something or a voice out of place in one recorder, but not on the other, I'm more likely to believe it is truly paranormal and possibly an EVP. Place your recorders near you, but far enough away where you won't hear your every breath but definitely keep the recorders in the same room as you. I like to put my recorders on opposite sides of me or in different spots in the room. You may decide to keep both of your recorders close to each other. I have never heard of a reason why putting both recorders next to each other would be a mistake. And there may be some experimental situations where having them right next to each other would be important. Sometimes I choose to use headphones with one of my recorders as I'm conducting the session. In theory, this gives you a better chance of having a real-time, two-way conversation, though I can't honestly say that I've ever heard an EVP in real-time through the headsets. But this also allows you to make mental notes of places where you think you may have heard something. A downside to this would be that using the headphones will most likely amplify sounds from the environment, sometimes making things more dramatic than they really are. Also, if knocks or other sounds are heard, you won't always know what direction they came from when headphones are being worn. Lastly, when it comes time to press record, starting both recorders at the same time or close to it will be very helpful when comparing timestamps during analysis. Now here's some advice for your session that may save you time and frustration later. 
Many paranormal investigators are familiar with what is sometimes called tagging while investigating or during an EVP session. Tagging helps to eliminate the possibility of claiming an investigator's sneezing or a stomach growl is an EVP or paranormal. Depending on how quiet and stable my environment is, sometimes I have to tag a lot. I use familiar language or some kind of quick and easy code that you can say aloud while recording. Quick is key here. You don't want to spend the whole time tagging and end up talking over precious EVP. Common tags that I end up using are Merrill, for any noise the dog might be creating, Shifting, if I have to shift in my chair or scratch my nose, Noise outside the window, Stomach, etc. So we're just about ready to hit record and start a session. Sometimes before a session, I will choose to do a quick meditation or prayer. This is certainly not required. There is a debate among some EVP researchers regarding whether praying or asking for protection prevents them from recording EVP. On many occasions, my meditation is a prayer or a request for help in sending or inviting willing spirits to help me with my recording and research. This is somewhat controversial, however. Sometimes I do all of this and sometimes I don't. But I try to document when I have and haven't, in case I notice correlations. Sometimes I record the meditation and prayer, and sometimes I choose to not start the recording until after. Sometimes before a session, I'll simply play relaxation or meditation music lightly in the background to help me chill out a bit. I think it is important to be in a good place or frame of mind when practicing any form of spirit communication. Once I start recording, I allow for at least 30 seconds of silence, since many times EVP are captured as soon as the recording starts. After the initial silence, often the first thing that comes out of my mouth is another verbal request for either protection or for help with inviting willing spirits to help me out. Then, unless documented somewhere else, I'll quickly state the date and time, describe the equipment and where it is placed, and anything unusual in my surroundings. Then after more silence, I'll state my intentions for having the session. This is often something like, my intention for this session is to make contact with willing spirits to pass on messages or to simply learn about life on the other side. Then I'll begin asking some basic questions. I feel it is important in EVP recording to treat those who may be joining us from the other side with absolute respect. I also feel that questioning spirits like they're in court or being interrogated is insulting and unnecessary. Another pet peeve of mine is when people speak as if they are automatically smarter than a spirit because they happen to be alive. Don't assume that they want or need your help. Don't assume they're miserable. After all, most of the time you won't really know who you're communicating with, and for all we know, our talkative spirits could be beings that have crossed over and are simply here for a visit, or somehow got your message that you were looking for volunteers. Too many investigators assume that whoever they are communicating with must be earthbound, or troubled, and in need of help, but if I'm ever asked for help, I'll certainly do my best. And here's another quick side note, just because I know someone will ask. I don't necessarily believe that capturing EVP in my home, or any other location for that matter, means it is haunted. From my experience and from the research of several others out there, it is my opinion that these voices aren't necessarily being recorded by a spirit that is standing right next to your recorder. Though that certainly could be the case in some situations such as with an earthbound spirit. Some very impressive and historic examples of spirit communication have come from spirits reporting to be communicating from a kind of station used for communicating from the other side. Unless I know who I'm speaking to, most of the time I try to spark conversation by asking the same usual questions, followed by whatever happens to be on my mind that day. Make sure you allow plenty of time 
20 to 30 seconds in between questions. Also, if you have a complicated or deep question in mind, consider breaking it up into smaller chunks. Some of the questions I start out with might include, Hello, is there anyone with me today? Please tell me your name. Have you communicated with me before? How many spirits are with me today? Do I know you? Are you a friend or a family member? Are there any messages you'd like to pass on today? Can you tell me what year it is? I don't always instigate it, but as you may know from a previous episode of the podcast, often I get spirits who like to let me know of their presence by knocks or rapping. I guess it's just the best way for some spirits to communicate with me. When this happens, I roll with it, and I try to continue the communication through the rapping. The famous Fox sisters, who inspired the spiritualist movement, were known to communicate through rapping, though their reputation is somewhat controversial. In my opinion, this kind of communication is just as fascinating and noteworthy as EVP. Also, the investigator in me would love to be touched or to witness physical objects being moved, so sometimes at the end of a session, I'll ask for some kind of validation through touch or the moving of an object. I've never personally experienced being touched in this way or witnessed any cool physical phenomena like moving objects, but if you're comfortable with it, why not ask? I know that when I get two or three loud knocks or raps when I ask for it, or if I ever capture a recorder being moved across the table, I'll be way more likely to be confident about any EVP captured in that session. To hear examples from my sessions where I communicate with spirits through rapping and knocking, be sure to listen to episode number six from July 30th, 2014. Before ending a session, I always give any spirits present the opportunity to give me any feedback or suggestions to make my research or the communication in general more successful. Then finally, I thank them for their energy and presence and invite them to return for future sessions. I think my sessions are longer than most people prefer. A typical session for me is 15 to 20 minutes. Just remember that depending on how thorough you are during the analysis of your audio recordings, it will take, at the very least, twice as long to listen and analyze as it took to record. If you are in a paranormal investigation at a location, many investigators, like myself, let the digital audio recorders roll the whole entire time. So that's why analysis of a paranormal investigation really probably should take longer than some teams do. Some of my more complicated and longer sessions from home can take a day or more to get through, and that's just with one recorder. You get the picture. If you're interested, there are other techniques and tools that you can combine with your EVP session, though if you're just starting out in EVP, I'd highly recommend keeping it basic for a while. More often than not, nowadays I allow time to use several other tools during the EVP session making it a kind of seance in general. This sometimes includes the use of background noise sources, such as white noise or pink noise. Pink noise is actually my preference. It could be as simple as leaving the DVR on that I mentioned earlier, or turning on a fan or soft music. Many believe, and some are convinced, that using background noise during EVP sessions may help entities to communicate. Imagine a spirit taking that noise and somehow rearranging or taking advantage of it to produce the communication. Also, I will sometimes use a spirit box, sometimes referred to as a ghost box or Frank's box, or any device that will help me practice the radio sweep method, which is an example of opportunistic EVP. But honestly, you have to be very careful when using these because there's certainly the potential of experiencing audio pareidolia, which is more commonly known as matrixing nowadays, and that could be an entire episode in itself. One last tool that I tend to use now won't surprise most of you at all, but I will also spend some time in my session, often by myself, 
but sometimes with a partner, using the Ouija board. As of this date, after around three years of occasional use of the Ouija, I've yet to experience or capture movement on the board. With that being said, I have captured a possible EVP that I've shared with listeners in a past episode. This communication seems to say, Ouija board, after I asked, what am I touching during a Ouija session? Pretty cool if you ask me. That was in episode number five from July 23rd, 2014, and was my first interview with Karen A. Dahlman. So as you can see, there are so many things you can do with an EVP session. You can have a very basic session, or you can be very detailed, go crazy with it, and pretty much make a full-time study of it. But as I always say, as long as you're being respectful and have good positive intentions, there's nothing wrong with it. Just be smart and have fun. Perhaps in a future episode, I'll get into how you can listen to and analyze your recordings in search of those possible spirit voices. Ironically, this week, the week that I was preparing this EVP episode, I was contacted by Todd Moster, I think is how you pronounce his last name. And Todd has a Kickstarter called The Afterlife Files, and it's part scientific expedition, part cutting-edge TV docuseries, and it says The Afterlife Files seeks to solve the greatest mystery of all time. And you'll have to watch the video there. It's all to do with EVP, and it's such a fascinating video. So check out the Afterlife Files on Kickstarter, and I'll include that link in the show notes. If you're into EVP, I think you'll like it. So that's it for this week. Before I go, I wanted to thank iTouch iPad iPhone owner for the really awesome review in the UK iTunes store for the podcast. Thank you so much. On next week's show, I talk once again to Karen A. Dahlman about her book, The Spirit of Creativity, Embodying Your Soul's Passion. Here's a little sneak peek. There's some information about this book that we know now that the general public may not necessarily have realized if they caught this book earlier. Can you tell us what role the Ouija played in writing this book? I thought you'd never ask. (laughs) Well, listen, this is what's so fun about this book. Um, And this book was, when I came out with it, it was published November 2012, although I wrote it in 96 and 97. And then I went through a dark night of my soul, and I had to really live out every single page of this book and use all my techniques in here and to, to build myself back to where I needed to be. I was left penniless, basically, and started over fresh, and it was a um, beautiful emergence uh, of myself and finding the strength in myself that I didn't quite know I had. But so when this book came out in November 2012, um, I immediately hit the airways. I was on Coast to Coast, the very first show, and I was talking about this book, yet Everybody, when I first, when I said the Ouija, the, my friends from the Ouija board helped me write this book. Everybody went Ouija board spirits. What? Oh my god! <laughs> so I had to quickly write my second book, <laughs> which everybody here knows, <laughs> Spirits of Ouija, because they wanted to know how did I do my communication. The, okay, so my first book, The Spirit of Creativity: Embodying Your Soul's Passion, was written with the help of my spirit friends. I would meet with them about every week. And I've se- I would have sessions with them, and, and I would talk to them about this book. They encouraged me to write this book. I knew I'd write a book one day, and it was more because of the work I was doing with my, with my clients, and I thought I'd be more therapeutically related to therapy and all this, blah, blah, blah. But it's not. Um, this book is more about your creative essence within to create the life of your dreams, to find your authentic self, to allow it to be heard, to express it in the world so you too can have an amazing life and co-create your world. And so it's more about empowering yourself to do that. And we all have this ability. We all have this ability. I really wanted to break through the myths of creativity, what we think is to be creative, and that it's not about the artistic elite or an expression. It's really about who you are intrinsically inside. You are naturally, inherently creative just by being born here on this planet. We're asked to co-create our lives. And this book will help you look at ways to do that. See you then. 
For show notes, including links to anything we may have mentioned in this episode, visit BigSeance.com, now the home of both the blog and the podcast. Just click on the Big Seance Podcast logo or find it in the menu. You can also find and subscribe to the show on iTunes and Stitcher. Do you have any comments or feedback? Please contact me at Patrick at BigSeance.com. You can call my feedback line at 7755-TELL-ME. That's 775 775- 583-5563. You can also record audio feedback right from the site using the SpeakPipe link included in the show notes. I could decide to include your voice in a future show. Thank you so much for listening and reading. Unfortunately, it's time to blow the candles out. But we'll see you and light them again next time.